نور الحمد لله رب العالمين Welcome everybody to our session number 31, the beginning of the chapter of Moses. Like I mentioned before, this is going to be a two-week chapter. So I'm going to read slightly more um, than usual today, um, because next week we're also going to be covering the extremely short chapter of Khalid as well, um, together with uh, the second half of the chapter of Moses. Um, I hope uh, you all had a good week. Um, I know I did. So let me just get cracking here into the right section. Where are we? Here we are. All righty. Uh, and puff of his cigarette. All right. The wisdom of eminence, hikmat al in the word of Moses, fi kalima musawiya. All right. The wisdom of the slaughter of the male children because of Moses was that the life of each boy killed because of him might revert to him as strength, since each one was killed as being potentially Moses. There was no ignorance in the matter since the life of each boy killed because of him had to revert to Moses, each life being pure and innocent, unsullied by the selfish aims and in the state of yea or bala, you know, to the divine summons, am I not your Lord? Alas to be rapical. Moses was thus a fusion of each life taken in his stead. Everything prepared for each child according to its spiritual receptivity then resided in Moses. For Moses, this was a special divine favor not bestowed on anyone before him. Have a sip of this coffee quickly. The wisdom of Moses is manifold, and if God wills, we will include in this chapter as much of it as the divine command dictates to my mind. Indeed, this is the first time I have spoken of such matters. From his birth, Moses was an amalgam of many spirits and active powers, the younger per person acting on the older. Do you not see how the child acts on the older person in a special way? So that the older person comes down from his position of superiority, plays and chatters with him, and opens his mind to him. Thus, he's under the child's influence without realizing it. Furthermore, the child preoccupies him with his rearing and protection, the supervision of his interest, and ensuring that nothing might cause it anxiety. All this power of his spiritual station since the child's contact with his Lord is fairly recent, being a new creature. The older person, on the other hand, is more distant from that contact. One who is closer to God exerts power over one who is further away from it. Just as the confidence of a king wields power over those further removed from his presence. The apostle of God would expose himself to the rain, uncovering his head to it, saying that the rain had come fresh from its Lord. Consider then how majestic, sublime, and clear is our prophet's knowledge of God. Even so, the rain had power over the best of humanity by virtue of its proximity to its Lord, like a divine emissary summoning him in his essence, in a silent way. He exposed himself to it so that he might reserve or receive what it had brought from its Lord to him. Indeed, he would not have exposed himself to it, but for the divine benefit implicit in its contact with him. This then is the message of water from which God created everything. So understand. As for the wisdom related to, to, to this, Moses is being placed in the basket and being cast on the waters. It is that the basket represents his humanity, while the waters represent the learning he acquired through the medium of his body such as it's obtained through the faculty of speculative thought, of sensation and imagination, all of which accrue to the human soul only through the existence of the elemental body. This is um, one of Ibn Arabi's forms of articulating his kind of a, a, 
uh, reformed notion of the Aristotelian intellecti, uh, of the soul and the body. When the soul attaches to this body and is com commanded to act in it and direct it, God allots these faculties to it as a means by which to achieve the direction God wishes for this vessel or basket in which resides the tranquility of his Lord, uh, or the Sakina or Shekina, is the actual correct uh, translation or the sense that Ibn Arabi is conveying here. Thus, he was cast on the waters that he might acquire by these faculties all kinds of learning. God told him that even though the directing spirit was the body's ruler, it directed it only through him. God granted to him those powers inherent in humanity and expressed in terms of the basket in Quranic and learned allusions. The same is true of the reality's direction of the cosmos, since he directs it only by itself or by its form. This he does in the same way as the child depends on the engendering of the father, of effects on their causes, of agreements on their conditions of attested things under evidence and of real, realizable things under realities. All such things are of the cosmos being nothing other than the realities working in it, which it does only through itself. As for our saying, or by its form, it means the form of the cosmos by which is meant the beautiful names and the sublime attributes by which the reality is named and described. Whenever we hear one of his names, we may discover its meaning and spirit in the cosmos, since he directs the cosmos only through its form. Therefore, he has said of the creation of Adam, who is the synthetic link of the attributes of the divine presence, which is the essence to the qualities and actions, surely God created Adam in his own image. His image being nothing other than the divine presence. In this noble epitome, which is the perfect man, he created all the divine names and realities which issue forth from him into the macrocosm outside him. God made him a spirit for the cosmos and subjected to him what is high and low by virtue of the perfection of his form. Just as there is nothing in the cosmos but gives him praise, so there is nothing that is not subject to this man by reason of what is invested in him by the reality of his form. God says he has subjected to you as a charge from him all that is in the heavens and the earth, so that everything in the cosmos is subject to man. Whatever truly knows this is the perfect man, while whoever knows it not is the animal man. Outwardly, the placing of Moses in the basket and the casting of the basket on the waters is an image of destruction, while inwardly, it mean it is meant it meant his escape from death. Thus his life was spared as the soul's life is spared from the death of ignorance by learning, as he says, or was dead from ignorance, and we revived him by learning, and we gave him a light by which to walk among men, which is the guidance. Is such a one like one in darkness that is error never to emerge therefrom, which means that he will never be rightly guided and he has decreed for his soul that he should have no goal or aim other than it. True guidance means being guided to bewilderment, that he might know that the whole affair of God is perplexity, which means perturbation and flux and flux is life. This um, now adumbrates, adumbrates a point that we had uh, last week in our discussion. There is no abatement and no cessation, all but all is being with no non-being. The same is the case with water by which the earth lives and moves, as he's saying, and it quivers in its pregnancy and swells in its bringing forth and brings forth every joyous pair. That is to say that it gives birth only to what is like it in nature. This pairing is the polarity inherent in all that is born or manifest from her, from nature. And just remember what he said about universal nature, that um, it is one of the highest uh, manifestations of the breath of the merciful itself. Similarly, the being of God has a certain multiplicity and diversity of names because of what is manifest of him in the cosmos innately requires the realities of the divine names, so that by it the cosmos, by its creator, the unity of multiplicity is confirmed. 
In respect to its essence, it is single as the essence of primordial substance is signal, but it is multiple in respect to the outer forms it bears within its essence. So it is with God in respect to the forms of, of his self-manifestation. He is the theater of the forms of the cosmos, taking into account his unity. How fine is the divine reaching, insight into which is a special favor granted by God uh, to whomsoever he wishes or desires. When Pharaoh and his people found him in the water by the tree, Pharaoh called him Moses, Musa, moon meaning water, and sa meaning tree in Coptic, which is true. So Ibn Arabi had a, uh, a special interest in linguistics as well. He shows this to us here and quite a few places in the Futuat al makia as well. Um, thus he called him according as he had found him, since the basket stopped by a tree at the water's edge. He intended to kill him, but his wife was inspired by divine words, seeing that God had create her, created her for per perfection, as our prophet said, when he attributed to her and to marry the perfection usually reserved for males. This is speaking about Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. She said to her husband, let him be a consolation for you and me. So it was that she was consoled with the perfection assigned to her, as we have said. Pharaoh's consolation was in, was in the faith God endowed him with when he was later drowned. God took him to himself spotless, pure and untainted by any taint, because he took him in the act of commitment before he could commit any sin, since submission to God erases all that has gone before it. Thus, he made of him a symbol of the love and care he may bestow on whomsoever he wills, lest anyone should despair of the mercy of God. For only the unfaithful people despair of the Spirit of God. Had Pharaoh been despairing, he would not have hastened to believe in God. This is an um, extremely controversial point in, in the whole book because this entire paragraph is speaking about Pharaoh. Um, per the Quranic narrative uh, about Pharaoh, so given the fact that Pharaoh was made an instrument of the protection of Moses, even though Pharaoh himself was responsible for the death of all these children, right? By that very act of protection, given what Ibn Arabi says at the beginning of the chapter, that all of those children who died, um, their spirits amalgamated in that of Moses. So by the very act of then turning around and protecting Moses and taking Moses into his own household, that entire sin is, is washed away whatever else he does afterwards. This is an extremely controversial point in Ibn Arabi's Fusus al-Hikam and has raised the ire of countless detractors um, because essentially Ibn Arabi is talking about the faith of Pharaoh, <laughs> right? That Pharaoh in, inadvertently is a moment. He goes on. Moses was, as Pharaoh's wife had said to him, of him, a consolation to you and me and perchance a benefit to us both. For God benefited both of them by him, even though they were not aware that he was the prophet at whose hands the kingdom and people of Pharaoh would come to destruction. When God had saved them from Pharaoh, his mother, mother's heart became empty, that is, empty of the anxiety that had afflicted her. Then God kept them from being suckled un until he might brought, be brought to his own mother's breast, so that he might make her pleasure in, in him complete. Such is also the case with the knowledge of the sacred law. He says, for every one of you, we made a way and a course, min haja, that he is a path, a shira. Well, min hajan or min haja means that it came from that way. This being an allusion to the source from which it came, which is sustenance for the law abiding servant, just as the branch of a tree feeds only from its root. This is some very ingenious wordplay that Ibn Arabi is, is uh, playing here. Thus, was it forbidden in one law is permitted in another from the formal standpoint. This does not mean that it has always been permitted, since the divine command is always a new creation that is never repeated. So be alert. This is indicated in the case of Moses by his being denied a witness. 
This is because the real mother is the one who suckles the child and not the one who bears him. The mother who bears him carries him as a trust from the father and he comes into being in her, in her and feeds on her menstrual blood, all which happens involuntarily, so that she has no claim on him. Indeed, he feeds only on that which would kill her and make her ill were it not to discharge from were it not to discharge from her. One might say, therefore, that the fetus has a claim on her, seeing that he feeds on that blood and thus protects her from the harm she might suffer were it to remain inside her and not discharge from her or be eaten by the fetus. Just a second. Okay. All right. The wet nurse is not like that. <clears throat> For by her suckling, she promotes his life and survival deliberately. This voluntary motherhood was provided by God for Moses from another, from the mother who was also who, who also bore him. Thus, none other than the mother who bore him was given the right to him so that she might find consolation also in rearing him and watching him grow on her bosom that she might grieve, might not grieve. Thus did God rescue him from the distress of the basket, and he pierced through the darkness of nature by the divine learning that God granted to him, even though he did not completely emerge from it. God tempted him many times, testing him in many situations, so that patient with God's trials might be realized in him. The first test was his killing of the Egyptian, which was inspired in him, by God and deposited in his inmost heart, although he himself did not know it. He did not really have any interest in killing him, although he did not hesitate when God's com command came to him. So now um, this very thorny issue about Moses' murder of the Egyptian is lifted to another plane, that this was God's own um, action through Moses. That is because the prophet is inwardly protected being unaware of something until God informs him of it. Thus, when al khedr killed the youth in front of him, Moses disapproved of that, forgetting his own killing of the Egyptian. So now there, uh, Ibn Arabi is making a parallelism, a very interesting one, between um, these three elements um, that happened in his encounter with Khidr and his own actions previously that he then repented for, even though Ibn Arabi is basically telling us that he didn't need to repent. Uh, because these were the divine act through Moses himself. Moses disapproved of that, forgetting his own killing of the Egyptian. Then he said to him, I did not do it on my own initiative. Trying to apprise him of his rank before he himself was informed that he, that he was, although unaware of it, protected against any tendency contrary to the divine will. In other words, no prophet can perform any action, however crazy it may seem, other than the divine will, the Mashiach, um, acting through that. So whatever that is, right? He also showed to him the sinking of the vessel, which symbolized destruction outwardly, while inwardly it meant deliverance from the action of a plunderer. In this, he was giving him a comparison with the basket by which he had been encompassed in the water, the outer aspect of which was destruction, deliverance being its inner significance. His mother had done it only out of fear lest the destroying hand of Pharaoh should sacrifice him in his helplessness before her eyes, despite what God had revealed to her, to the effect that she would not be aware or see. Although she felt a strong urge to suckle him, she cast him out on the waters when she feared for his safety. As the proverb goes, what the eye does not see, the heart does not grieve about. It was not because of something she could see that she feared and grieved for him, having, as she did, a strong intimation that God might restore him to her because of her trust in him. Thus she lived with him in this feeling, hope and despair jostling within her so that when she was inspired by God, she said to herself, perhaps this is the messenger at whose hands Pharaoh and the Egyptians will be destroyed. Thus she lived with this feeling as was, and was content with it, it also, it being also a form of knowledge. Then, 
When he was sought for the crime he had committed, he left the palace in flight, outwardly afraid, while inwardly seeking deliverance since all motivation springs from love. The observer being diverted from this by, by its other less important causes. That is because the origin of all motivation is the movement of the cosmos out of its state of non-existent in which it was latently until its existence. It being, so to speak, a staring from immobility or rest. The movement that is the becoming into existence of the cosmos is a movement of love. Right? So now this explains to us what he meant a couple of chapters ago by um, the non-existent exerting influence on the existence. And this is the reason. This just glossed why that happens. That movement of love. This is shown by the apostle of God in the saying, I was a, I was a hidden treasure and I long to be known. This is the hadith of the hidden treasure. It's actually attributed to David. So that for this longing, the cosmic would not have become manifest in itself. Thus, its movement from non-existence into existence is the love of the creator for it to happen. Similarly, the cosmos longs to be to behold itself in existence as it did in its latency, so that in every respect, its movement from the latency of non-existence into existence is a movement of love by the reality and the cosmos. So two things here. Um, he's asserting it is both the love of the reality and the, and the love of the cosmos for that latent thing to become an actuality. But as we know, the cosmos itself is a mirror of the reality. Perfection is loved for itself so that God's knowledge of himself as being beyond all need of the world is for himself alone. There remains only the completion of the degree of self-knowledge, true knowledge of what is ephemeral, which stems from the essences of the cosmos when they come into existence, the quiddities. The image of perfection is complete only with knowledge of both the ephemeral and the eternal the rank of knowledge being perfected only by both aspects. Similarly, the various other grades of existence are perfected since being, since being is divided into eternal and non-eternal or ephemeral. Eternal being is God's being of himself, while non-eternal being, being is the being of God in the forms of the latent cosmos. It is called ephemeral because parts of it are manifest to others, while being is manifest to itself in the forms of the cosmos. Thus, being is perfect, the whole movement of the cosmos being the movement of love for perfection, so understand. <clears throat> I'll read one more page. Yeah, I'll read one more. I'll read a little bit more. Consider then how he relieves the distress of the divine names and the lack of the manifestation of their effects in the cosmos. This is because God loves relief, which may be achieved only through formal being, whether high or low. So it is confirmed that movement for love, there being no movement in existence except for love. Although some of the learned are aware of this, others are made ignorant of it by the impact of more immediate circumstantial factors and their influence over the soul. <clears throat> Moses' fear of the consequences of his killing the Egyptian was outwardly apparent, although the fear contained within itself the desire or love for escape from execution. Although he fled when he became afraid, in reality he fled when he began to desire escape from Pharaoh and his designs. <clears throat> he does indeed mention the more immediate and evident cause of his fleeing, which was the real cause, as the bodily form is to man. The desire for escape being implicit, just as the human spirit is implicit in the body. For the benefit of the many, the prophets express themselves on this matter in an outer fashion, limited as they are by the understanding of the hearer. This is because the apostles consider only the generality of man, men being well aware of their level of understanding. Our own prophet said concerning the question of level in the matter of worldly gifts, I will give a certain man a gift, even though I prefer another, lest God 
cast them into the fire. Since he considered him weak of intelligence and insight and governed by greed and mere instinct. Thus, the knowledge they bring is couched in terms su suitable for the lowest understanding, so that one who has no depth of understanding may go no further than the outward forms of the message. <coughs> Wonder at its outward, outer manifestation and think that to be the furthest limit of knowledge. On the other hand, one of refined understanding who would probe to the depths for the pearls of wisdom he deserves to find says, this is the outer, outer garment of a king. Thus he examines the quality of the garment and the fineness of its cloths and thereby learns the worth of the one whom he covers. So acquiring knowledge denied to the other who understands nothing of this. Since therefore the prophets, apostles, and their heirs know that such people exist in the world and among their own peoples, they strive to express what they say openly so as to combine what is outer and public with what is special and inward, so that the special person will understand what the generality understand and more, as is appropriate to that special capacity which distinguishes him from the ordinary man. While those who, who are charged to convey the knowledge are content with this. <clears throat> Then this then is the wisdom implicit in, in his Moses, but saying, I fled from you when I feared you. He did not say I fled from you from a desire for sa safety and well-being. Then he came to Madian and found two maidens and obtained water from them without any payment. He then went back to the shade of God and said, O Lord, I am I am in dire need of the good you sent down to me. Thus equating his action in obtaining water with the good that God had sent down to him, speaking of himself as being in dire need of God for the good he was. Khidr showed to him the wall being built for nothing, and Moses chided him for that. <coughs> he then reminded him of his obtaining water without payment and other things he did not mention until Muhammad wished that Moses would keep quiet and not interfere until God had relayed, related their story to him, so that he might learn what Moses had attained to without being aware of it. Had he been aware of it in himself, he would not have failed to recognize in Al-Khid, whom God had confirmed to him as, as purified and equitable. Moses, however, was unaware of God's purification of Al-Khid and forgot the condition he had laid down, if we were to follow him, which is a mercy for for us who are frequently forgetful of God's command. <clears throat> Had Moses been aware of it, al khidr would not have said to him, what, have, what you have no experience of. Which is to say, <clears throat> he knew things of which Moses had no experience. As Moses knew things that he did not know, Thus he was just to Moses. As for the wisdom implicit in his parting from Khidr, it is in God saying, do what the apostle tells you to do and refrain from what he forbids you. Those of the learned in God who know the true worth of the apostleship and the apostle need to go no further than this saying. Khidr, knowing that Moses was an apostle of God, paid careful attention to what he did and said, so that the proprieties might be maintained as regards to his position vis-a-vis -vis an apostle. Moses said to him, if I ask you anything more, then do not keep company with me. When therefore it happened a third time, al said to him, this is the parting between you and me. At this, Moses said and did nothing, demanding no more of his company, since he re recognized the significance of the rank that had prompted him to deny him any further companionship. Moses, therefore, remained silent, and they parted company. And I'll leave it there. Uh, this will be the first part, and then the remainder we will cover next week. And so I open the floor, the comments, revelations, whatever you want to talk about.
Who wants to go first? Go first. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. Just go. Yeah. So, um, uh, could you uh, clarify the what, what he said at the beginning of the chapter? I know you you kind of uh, went back to it about the you know the transfer of the potentiality of the infants to Moses. Like I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. That's like when I was reading this the first time. I I like I was like shocked that I couldn't understand how like because it kind of contradicts what's in the rest of the book a bit because the potentiality should have already been there latent in Moses. So how could it be added on? later like that i'm trying to understand that this is one of the most interesting while simultaneously difficult ar arguments that even arabi kind of brings into the fosus al hikam he um in the futwat al makia the kind of general principle about what he says here is kind of articulated um and that is that at the level of the universal soul right which is the which is the level at which these children elevated the moment of their death right um, because the prophets are, you know, the, they're, you know, the 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 intellect of the prophet is descending from the level of the universal intellect. So um, when it forms and coagulates into a human body, whatever um, whatever is related to it on that level of the universal soul and nature, etc., accrues to that prophet. This is what Ibn Arabi is trying to say in relation to Moses, because. Um, the reason why these children were killed was because of Moses, right? Thus, their deaths, um, in principle, their souls at the moment of elevation um, came into Moses or was, um, this is not reincarnation. I mean, because you're, you're dealing with multiple souls here, not just one. So all these collective souls that were tyrannized and oppressed and killed as babies um, became... Um, composite in one person as its principle. Okay, so um, I guess like trying to uh, grasp like the temporality of that, that's something that happened, like it was kind of um, preordained or something that occurred like before the spatial temporal like manifestation of Moses it was kind of something that was like prearranged maybe was that like or did it happen also simultaneously because well, like, i know he doesn't there, there, there's a yeah. there, there's a simultaneity to all of this and there's also a, a presuppose simultaneity between the temporal and the eight temporal this is why he then goes on in the next couple of paragraphs to talk about um you know the 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 kind of the soul body intellect you know that the soul is the governor but the body is from it is from through the body that that the soul is actually learning and experiencing the nature of the world. So he takes that um, imagery of Moses being in the basket as kind of that, uh, you know, as kind of giving us that that symbol. Yeah, that that's also uh, something that like I also wanted to uh, touch on as well because it kind of, it's kind of, it is kind of related because now we we see here kind of like okay now you know in previous chapters he's kind of. Um, I don't want to say degraded, but kind of he doesn't really hold the intellect, like the speculative, rational intellect to be something very, uh, you know, not that no, he doesn't hold it in the highest esteem. But here, you know, he's talking about basically knowledge gained through the senses. So yeah, um, that obviously not just speculative, but like, um, you know, that would include that, like knowledge gained through the senses, knowledge gained as well through the combination of reason and, and the understanding and things like that. Which is basically um, so then, him, which is basically him basically saying that you know there's a trajectory from from sensual knowledge to gnosis, right? Um, and that none of this is possible without the the basic building block of the sensual knowledge to begin with, right? That even the rational, you know, the, the rational knowledge that human beings gain is a, is an impossibility without the sensual knowledge um, being the basic building block of that. To begin with yeah. yeah so um but then um there's also that like you know as a manifestation of an you know the eternal you know the archetypes you are like that there's something there that's already blatant so it's not so maybe there's like a sort of mediation or sort of like i guess a flow between you know empirical knowledge which is then synthesized through the intellect into speculative yeah. rational knowledge and then yeah. that also goes like back to things which were already latent before you gain that knowledge it's kind of like this yeah. sort of builds on um, itself 
Yeah, yeah. What he's saying yeah. is it builds on itself. Yeah. So then, what? What I, I know, reincarnation is something that he doesn't subscribe to, like that we already, uh, as we discussed previously. So then, upon the upon death, then, like that knowledge that was gained by the soul through the reason and the everything that was gathered together, that is something that is. You mean the knowledge um, of of what the, the 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 children that had been killed before him, or just it just that end as well as like the like because that was already there, and then there's you know what he's gaining. Through his life, like all of his life experiences, and then well, he what, passes what, away. In this particular context, I mean that what you said is kind of implied, sort of. But what he's yeah. saying in this particular element of it is, um, since these were babies, right, and they hadn't developed yet to that point of you know into the you know, rad radiocinative and the um, as the uh, the intellect because of that. And he's, you know, he kind of underscores that they were so new that they were, you know, just very recent from their locus of saying yes, or bala, to the eternal, all, already always summons of am I not your Lord? Alas the Virapiko. So because of, due to that, right, and because the, it, it, just remember, all of this is, 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 on the one hand, he's using a very literal narrative in a very literal way to unpack it. But with the intention of trying to um, take that literal narrative to point to other things going on, right? So you can take this opening paragraph simultaneously as being that, you know, any element of knowledge, sensual knowledge, intellectual knowledge, whatever it is, right, um, is what builds upon itself through a given person so you can take this you can either take this literally as the soul of the departed or you can take this figuratively as you know elements of of uh, if you would um elements of dead knowledge that then coagulate into a living one within a single person yeah and, and, it, and it also because it because it uh, feeds back into something he said in a previous chapter about like I don't think we discussed it in depth, but you know, lowering yourself, he says you have to lower yourself into the animal, like the appetite yeah, type of soul, exactly. and then yeah. that's part of that as well. That's part um, of that. Yeah. Ch yeah. Chapter of Ilyas, yeah, he said that in yeah. in the chapter of Ilyas, yeah. So there are certain, there's several different things that he says here that kind of echo what he was saying in the in the Ilyas chapter. So yeah, that is definitely the case. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess uh, now, like. You know, obviously, um, I, I had heard, like, I know you touched on it. I had heard about the whole thing about Pharaoh. Like, this is actually pretty famous. It's like the most famous. Yeah, um, one of the most famous. Yeah, the Zeus, yeah. yeah, the thing like that, that's like, if you see anyone, you know, telling you not to go near Ibn Arabi, this is what they, they mentioned this first. Like, it's like number one on the list. So mm. I, 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 I do kind of, I, I know you've explained it, but um, it is like, obviously, like it's not a figure. Like you, you understand rationally, like what he's saying, it makes sense. But like accepting that and like you know having that tranquility and saying, okay, well, you know, Pharaoh was just doing his job. Like Pharaoh was part of the divine um, there's, manifestation. There's it's a kind great, of, It's really hard. There's a great saying in Persian. One of the great Persian aphorisms um, is the following: Adush sabab khair shabat, meaning that the enemy shall be the instrumental cause of good. Right. Um, in a in a roundabout sort of way, Ibn Arabi is saying precisely this very thing, right? Um, by the same token, kind of offering this dialectic that um, the enemy that becomes an instrument of God, you know, in the performance of the good, even though, you know, the enemy might be a, you know, put whatever creative adjective before their name you want. Um, in a sense, because of their usage by the divine will, right, then is at some point absolved in their outward act of oppression, tyranny, and all the rest of it, right? This is one thing he's trying to say, because these things are, are, are um, and what even Arabic is doing is sort of a language game, but it's a very interesting one that has real serious ramifications for any kind of soteriology in that, He's almost, he is, without coming out and saying it, he's asserting that 
um, in these very narrative in these narratives of the Quran, the Bible, etc., there's a dramaturgy unfolding. And by virtue of God's presence in every element of the dramaturgy, you know, these um judgment claims that one would otherwise, you know, naturally assume about the antagonists, right? Um, have there's more going on beneath them that needs needs to be considered because it is basically the hand of God in every level of the equation that is being played, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things, one of the issues that he raises that is kind of in a, in a very distant but very interesting way kind of um, informing all of that, he talks about the child, right? That this baby becomes the, 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 the focus of the attention of the adult, right? To the point that the fixation of the adult on this child becomes a situation where the child is has dominance and subjugation. Over the adult, anyone who's been a parent, right, knows this instinctively. You know, all the sleepless nights you have, the feeds, and three o'clock in the morning, you wake up, your baby is crying, they're hungry, or they need to be changed, or all of that kind of stuff, right? This, you know, one year period where you are basically a slave to this um, extremely, you know, tiny human being. Um, you learn that this becomes an instinct. You, you, you know what Ibn Arabi is talking about. So then he is using this argument from, you know, in a, in a kind of very interesting way that um, even the, the prophets, in a sense, represent this, this innocent child, right? So that with Moses and, the, and his situation with Pharaoh, even though um, the one subjugated is, has authority, okay, um, nevertheless, this child has subjugated that Pharaoh, the very Pharaoh that went out of his way um, to stop this, this causality of someone emerging out of these Israelites to kill it. And as we move further into the chapter, this whole contest between Mo Moses and Pharaoh becomes quite an interesting um, thing in itself. In, in the next part that we'll look at, where, the, where you know Moses, Moses comes back and he's now a prophet, um, and, you know, the, the questioning that happens between Pharaoh and the answers that Moses gives, etc. This whole dynamic begins to change. And what Ibn Arabi is basically offering us now is a very interesting dramaturgy where the divine presence is inhabiting every element of this of this story. That's uh, this narrative that is unfolding. Right. Um, and the long and short of it is basically Ibn Arabi telling us that. The divine names and the manifestation of the divine names, the manifestation of, of the real, is in every equation because there's no vacuum in existence. So antagonism itself, right, is basically part of a dialectic. And so given this, from Ibn Arabi's point of view, every node of this antagonism, of, of this larger dialectic, in the final analysis cannot be held blameworthy, given the outcome. And given what has been um, the presence that has been propelling this entire process the whole time. Now, this is extremely controversial because from a the from an Islamic theolo or from any Abrahamic theological point of view, it just basically negates um the the kind of the outward soteriology of these creeds, especially like in a creed like Christianity that has very sharp elements of the saved and the damned, right? Um, Ibn Arabi is basically relevant, relativizing the whole thing. Whereby even the antagonist in the end is saved. And that is because he's also has been telling us, you know, leading up to this chapter, um, that even the denizens of hell will not experience eternal damnation. The damnation is actually temporary. Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> I, I know um it, it, we have uh, like discussed that in the past. I know it's not really the fact that that makes complete sense rationally, and I don't really have a problem that you know dog like it kind of contradicts dogma. That's not my issue. My issue is like you know as a human being, you know you exist as as a temporally located person, like individual. You know you can read the narrative of of Moses and the Pharaoh and like get through it. Like you have so from that perspective, you have complete knowledge of how it 
goals, but then you go back into the real world and then, you know, you see the pharaohs of your time and like, you know, understanding that, okay, you on an intellectual level, you understand what's going on on an emotional level, like accepting that. That's like, I know that's like for me, just for me personally, like that's I, the sticking point. As you all know, I, as you all know very well, I have very, um, I have very clear views about what is happening in the Middle East at the, at the moment, especially in Palestine. You know, there's a genocide. But let's look at it from what Ibn Arabi just said to us in this chapter, right? The the child or the youngling um, or the weak subjugating the strong. This has happened. As, as terrible and as horrific and all of that as the experience in the Palestinian people is in this genocide, yet... Um, these people of Palestine have subjugated the Zionists and the American Empire simultaneously because the focus is on that. Right? So as they're being slaughtered, right, the, the pharaoh of the time who has unleashed this, this slaughter on these innocents itself is subjugated and daily being ever more subjugated in this process of the revolt of these Palestinians against it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've become. I guess it is like because they, they, it is talked about in the preface for this chapter. Like, um, you know, the 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 what you said, the dramaturgy, the struggle between the uh, wish and the will. Um, you know that that's something that um, it, 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 I guess um, for me, it's something that is like on the broader scale of history. It's correct. It's on the micro scale. It's like basically just very one sided. Like if we're dealing with it materially, obviously we. We shouldn't do that, but it's, you know, it's very easy to do that. And I do agree. Like everything you're saying, I, I don't have any disagreement. It's more like a, I don't know, maybe um, just personally, I, I, I'm i a more of a, I guess, like emotionally, I have an emotional bent towards I, sort I, of that I, kind of thing. I see that I have the same issue, but, um, you know, because, you know, the bad in from the, from the level of the emotional intelligence, the antagonist has no redeeming quality. Okay. But from the level of gnosis, which is beyond the emotional, it reaches the level of the intuitive. Um, what Ibn Arabi is saying is correct. That even though emotionally, you know, we were, you know, we are wishing the worst on, on our enemy from that emotional intelligence, but from the um the no noetic point of view, um, especially when one witnesses, which is comes back to that point from last week, of witnessing being the highest form of gnosis. When you witness the divine will permeating even that enemy and acting through it, then then the outcome cannot be but but what Ibn Arabi is trying to point to us. That doesn't mean it is not saying that doesn't mean that one cannot condemn the enemy, one cannot denounce the enemy. You can do all of that, or you know what the Shiites say in their practice of Tabara, you know, um, the 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 you know the execration, the you know. You can do that. That's fine. You know, um, but from the larger perspective of things, it it makes absolutely no philosophical sense, um, which is what the, the emotional intelligence is telling you. It makes no philosophical sense to assert that there is no inhabitation of the divine presence in that antagonist. Right? Because that, yeah. that that divine presence must inhabit both the negation and the affirmation of itself. I think it, it is like if we were to make it a philosophical principle, it's about what he says further, like the flux, everything's in flux, everything's in and flux yeah. in, includes like conflict. So yeah. you know what you what you what you really want isn't like a, an end to the conflict, like a stillness and a non-being sure. sort of way, but you kind of have to just accept the you know, and, part and, of the... and let's look at this conflict in the Middle East. You know, the Palestinian people are are revolting and fighting back against their Zionist occupator out of, out of their own desire and love to be independent and free and to be treated as 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 proper human beings and not like animals. They want to end the apartheid. Um, the Jew and the Zionist is fighting and massacring these people out of love to preserve what it thinks is its way of life. Um you know, that these natives are trying to take away from it, right? So on the one hand, one can say that the divine will in the matter, the universe of divine will in the matter is that the Zionist entity end, right? 
but the volition has already established the Zionist entity. So here we are uh, witnessing a conflict, a tension between the divine will and the volition unfold. Yeah, I mean, because I think it, the key thing is that it brings out certain contradictions, like, you know, things that wouldn't have been revealed, unfortunately, without what's going on today have not, like, wouldn't have been unless they happen. Like, it's like, you know, you where do you stand when it comes to things like this? Like, you don't have the opportunity unless it actually, you know, transpires as a real unfolding, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, I guess, I mean, history is a very uh, grim, but, it, you know, produces this sort of um outcome and it, it is like it's it's part of the unfolding of being of creation you know the the that that's um it's just you know it, I, I i understand everything it's just you know i want to <laughs> uh, fixate too much on it. i guess it's more of a spiritual thing it's like you just you know certain you know uh temperaments like my own like i don't really like i'm, I'm very anti-conflict like even in my own life if if you know i can and the conflict, even if I take a loss, I prefer to do that than to even engage in any way. Um, so I guess that's just something that's personal. Um, well, and I, and I don't want the... What what Ibn Arabi says is articulated in several different ways in some of the other works that I read, not from Ibn Arabi, but like for like um, uh, the Bob's commentary on the Surah of Joseph, where he basically asserts almost identically the same sort of thing in another way, is that on the one hand, we have a static unity, right? Where there is just stillness. Nothing happens. Nothing moves forward. Nothing moves back, right? That static unity is um, counterproductive. And this is not how the forces of, of, of God, God's will does not act that way. So if necessary, then God begins to act through the disunity, right? In order to resolve these dialectics, to raise the situation to a, higher level and into the true unity of things, right? So you can look at all of these calm, because conflict is an, it's, it, I won't use the word necessary, but conflict is an inevitability due to the flux of existence. And this is what Ibn Arabi is also trying to put his finger on here, because, you know, everything moves, everything is flux, um, and each moment to moment to moment, we have a new uh, creation. There's a re endless recreation of things happening. Yeah, this very it's very much um uh, uh, uh to take us further afield it's very much mirrored as well um in you know sh i don't know if you've read uh, Schelling's uh, essay concerning human freedom that's yes, like that have, idea is kind of there as well yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um I, I i don't i don't have any other questions i guess just one other i guess it's more of a, a, a humorous comment um sure. in terms of this chapter we we can see where ibn Arabi falls on the um you know, pro-life, pro-choice abortion uh, debate, because he goes, does go into that. He has that sort of... That was, like, fascinating, his uh, embryology, like his, you know, detour into that. But I guess, uh, the, you know, the fetus is the, you know, the one that's uh, elevated above the mother. I never expected something like that in this chapter, but, uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's just something very interesting. <laughs> Ibn Arabi is well known for throwing these sorts of curveball, curveballs because he's on both sides of it, of, of the discussion. I mean... Um, can you imagine some evangelical reading some of this stuff in Ibn Arabi? You know, um... <laughs> it's like it's like it, 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 he puts it in places where you would never expect. Like I would yeah. never expect this chapter to cover something like this, but that was yeah. very interesting when I was reading it. <laughs> Anyone else want to say something? Hassan, Hossein, Jeff, anybody? Uh, okay, Sheikh, I'll take the stage. Uh, here, uh, if you can a little bit more uh, to the saying that love is the primary cause of motion, which to me uh, seems uh, somehow similar to what uh, Sheikh uh, Sukharvardi says, mm -hmm. that the primary reason for the spinning of the heavenly uh, spheres is uh, their observation of the, yeah. of the relative intellects. Yeah, yeah. 
Harakat al muhabba is what he uses, the phrase Surawaji uses in several um, of his prayers and the imagery that he uses, that the movement of love or shok is another word that he uses, that, that intense love for the principle above themselves is the, is the reason, is the basis of the movement of the celestial spheres, yeah. Uh, the next thing I don't uh, get it very much, but uh, here, uh, when the Sheikh says that uh, God, He is ruling this world by the mean of uh, the means of this world. Uh, uh, so the, the same way, the soul is ruling uh, over the body by the means of yeah. the body and uh, the means uh, the, uh, the intellectual faculties so here does the sheikh uh, what he implies because it is uh, this is a uh, long argument uh, in islamic philosophy yeah are our intellectual faculties, for example, uh, uh, our uh, imagination, our uh, uh, common uh, uh, mm, uh, are they uh, mujarrat mm -hmm. or are they uh, material? So, uh, on which side is, he, uh, is here a Sheikh uh, Muhyiddin? He is actually very interesting you bring this up, because what Ibn Arabi is asserting, particularly with this argument, he's on the side of both. Neither Mujarrad or Murakya, neither abstract nor compound, because, for a simple reason, is that it's through these, it's through this intellecti that is happening between soul and body that is gathering information where the um, soul or intellect is is projecting meaning on what it is experienced, right? So implicitly, what he's kind of trying to tell us also at the same time is that this question between abstract and, and concrete is kind of phrased incorrectly because from the ultimate perspective of being, right, it is both and neither. These are just silhouettes that are of being that come into existence and go out of existence. So the concreteness and abstractness is only being projected and understood as such by that particular instance of that soul or person who is experiencing the world from that vantage point, right? Which is another way also of stating that there's really a transparency between the, the phenomena and the noumena, which is a real central point that even Arabi is trying to make throughout everything that he says. Um, whereas uh, the rationalists and the peripatetics of Islamic philosophy and also the mutakallamun, schools of theology, can't seem to get their head around this sort of argument. Something is either this or that, it can't be both, and neither, simultaneous. This is what I meant, that we got to take Ibn Arabi's non-dual kind of mantek logic very seriously. Um, because he's not operating from that. I mean, he's using here, I mean, he's using Aristotelian categories. Several times he's using Aristotelian um, syllogistic forms of argu argumentation, then comes back and completely deconstructs it in the next point that he's making. Uh, so it is, uh, in a sense, this argument for Mujarrat and, and uh, material, it is a false dichotomy. Yes, uh, in the... ultimately... From the point of view of Wahdat al Wujud, the Muraka, the compound, and the Mujarrat, the abstract, are points of perspective. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another one, I liked very much the uh, the shimil, uh, uh, which the Sheikh made between. Uh, the circling of Musa alayhi salam that uh, all the women uh, which were present before him that uh, Allah ta'ala he stopped him 
uh, to 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 suckle from them, but only for his uh, from his mother. And uh, the the similitude was that uh, the different Sharias are this mothers, and even the different Sharias they exist. Nevertheless, you have uh, your own specific Sharia you are going to follow, and which, uh, for me specifically, and just wait uh, a minute, moment before you go on. Your specific there, there are two senses to read this passage in 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 this chapter. It, it it can be referring either to the sacred law as the formal Sharia, or it could mean the internal law of each person in the world. You can read that particular sentence in there like that. Okay, can you el elaborate a little more? Okay. There's a... Uh, I understand, but yeah. uh, just yeah. want to hear in more detail. Well, <laughs> he is using deliberately vague language, right, to say, um, to say, on the one hand, the Sharia, as what we understand as the Sharia to be, but by the same token, he's also instancing the internal law of things relevant to each person, irrelevant to each lord that each person is. And not necessarily the Sharia capital S, chapter she. So what I get from it that uh, it is uh, critical for every one of us to find that uh, internal uh, and uh, if I link it to the Shia understanding that uh, it, uh, we also may say that um, it shows the critical importance fighting the Imam of uh, the time because uh, Outwardly, it may appear that the Sharia or the sacred laws of the different religious or denominations internally in one religion, they are very similar, but nevertheless, there is no uh, uh, repetition, there is no tekrar, so you should be very awakened where you are and what you are going to, to do. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. And it's not only about the search for the Imam Zaman, right? Um, it's also the way that the Ismailis and Alam specifically put it, which incidentally occurs in the earliest of Imami Hadim. It is finding that internal Imam, the Hujjatul, uh, you know, the, the Hujjatul Batina that the Imams talk about, right? That is what Ibn Arabi is putting his finger on, the imam of your being, who has its own sharia, as it were, because that is the Lord, your own individual Lord. And that's also very on the spot, because uh, we have the tendency uh, in arguing about the imam that we only focus on some kind of external personality without paying any attention uh, with the connection in the heart, finding uh, him internally in us. Or even to the point of, you know, there's, there's certain exercises that some of the... Um, Iranian Shiite orders used to perform. I don't know whether they do it anymore, but um, where after a certain point, uh, the adept um, goes into a khalwa and begins to imagine themselves as being annihilated in one of the imams, whether it be Ali, whether it be even, you know, you know the Imam Hassan al-Askari, to the point that you be, basically the point of that exercise is to for you to realize your imam, the imam of your being by that exercise, right? Because the 
exoteric religious impulse of projecting someone that is coming, right? Whose characteristics we all know, blah, blah, blah. This is what the text say. This is what this says. This is what that says. Um, in a sense, is a ruse. And this is what even the imami hadith themselves are in, implicitly kind of indicating when they're talking about al-bada, the alteration of the divine will. When you take that, and then you take these other hadith by the imams about um, the hujjatul batina, right? Then it is it is almost a logical conclusion is that the imams are basically trying to push their khawas to realize that hujjatul batina in whatever face that they want, right? Because wherever you turn is the face of God. And the imam is the face of God. So if you internalize and you bring out that imam of your being, that hujjatul batana, which the imami hadith in Kulaini talk about, then um, it stands the reason that you become the imam zaman of your time to yourself. And so at that point, there is a sharia associated with yourself and law, whatever that is, you know. But to get there, right, is not just a mere assertion to, to that truth. There is a process, and that is the saluk. And that saluk is a difficult task, you know, and, and um, not all will get there to that point of realizing the amount of their being. But this is the goal. Thank you very much, Sayyidi. I was yep. still thinking of, uh, you said earlier that Ibn Arabi is kind of relativizing things here. And uh, ever since you said that, I've been going back and forth between the, the eternal conflict between philosophical relativism on one hand and absolutism on the other. And what you guys are discussing right now kind of sounds like the difference between a relativistic perspective and an absolutist perspective. And like, why you know i don't know it's like there's the saluk is the difference you know what yeah. i mean like yeah like until one goes through certain stages of wayfaring um you know it's I, i'm not sure how to even say what i'm thinking but obviously the situation is not completely relativistic i mean because that would negate the concept of truth yeah and of course we're all about truth so we we well, have to reject as that great hadith from um the sixth imam says about um predestination and free will the matter is between the two yeah, it's yeah right. amre, it's somewhere in between the two but yeah. um to use star wars analogy right only the sith Think in absolutes, concrete absolutes, right? And mm -hmm. this is the problem mm -hmm. with exoteric religion is that's all they think of. In all of mm -hmm. their iterations, they think, you know, what is in the Quran, what is in the Hadith, etc., is literally, that is the case. No, uh, There's no place for argumentation, interpretation, or, you know, any kind of investigation whatsoever. You take it or you leave it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Our way or the highway, right? Right. We know that that's not what life is like, right? Mm -hmm. So what the Gnostic does, what the person on the Saluk, on the, on the wayfaring does, begins to learn through that um, wayfaring that that, you know, what these Sith think about the issues are completely BS. You know, there are nuances to absolutely everything, including their own position, right? But that doesn't mean that then during the Saluk, you know, we relativize everything into complete oblivion. The only thing that is relativized into, into complete ob oblivion is our own ego and perspective on the matter, because the point of the exercise is to annihilate all of that in the reality, in the absolute reality itself, who, who is both um, the standard, the touchstone for what is both relative and concrete simultaneously, which goes back to what Hassan was asking for previously about the difference between the abstract and the concrete, the mujadra and the murakyam, that is a you know eternal um debate in Islamic theology and philosophy. Here Ibn Ari is saying is this, this 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 whole debate is useless because you know that which is setting that is that which is the touchstone for both the concrete and and the abstract is God. It's the reality. Right? 
So from this perspective, it is both relative and absolute. It is, you know, and he says this further on when he's talking about, um, you know, absolute existence and relative existence. Which exactly, which which is almost a perfect analogy for what you guys were talking about between, uh, you know, the the situation with concrete and abstract. I mean, is would you would you see uh, say that there's a direct analogy between Absolutely. concrete and yeah. and, uh, and and absolute and you know abstract and relativistic, or maybe not a perfect analogy, but a close analogy anyway. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in, in other you. words. There's there it's both and neither simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. The same. Um <clears throat> yeah, I'll I'll just uh, share a thought that I had. Um I was just thinking about the how he's he, he wants to it seems like he's he's trying to guide us in this chapter to understand what we love. Like that's one way of looking at it. He wants us to like mm. think about. And I was I was using this for my own sake. He doesn't use these terms, but I was thinking of it in terms of like essential and accidental motivations. Mm. Yeah, which, which helps me make sense of it because what he's saying is he's not saying that we have any other motivations. Essentially besides love it's just that we get distracted by 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 like fear or disgust or whatever is immediate um so it, it would make sense to call that accidental because it's not that's not true it's not the true motivation for anything so everything is in its essence is is moving because of because of love yes and it was just it just made me think that <clears throat> if you can come into an awareness of what you already love because you're already essentially moving towards it then you can maybe start to guide the the process of your own haraka like your own movement of your own being and so that that would be the difference is that everyone is acting not or everything is acting on the basis of love but only some people can can come into consciousness of it and then presumably you can start to guide that that process and, yes Wow, that's it. Anyway, nice so, ring. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, the que so the question that I have then is about perfection, because that, this brings in a lot of this sounds like Mula Sadra. Yeah, um, it is because that's I mean Mula Sadra is basically the final development of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of things. One is like the this adds something to that whole "I was a, a hidden treasure and longed to be known" thing. It's not just about longing to be known. It's about it's about perfecting knowledge because mm -hmm. God has absolute self knowledge, but He doesn't have the that particular ephemeral knowledge, self knowledge. Um, oh, so perfection. He does. he does, and He doesn't. <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> but but there's the movement towards perfection. That's the motivation for for the creation of everything. Yes. Right. So it's like so so that is the that seems to be the telos of yes of the creation. Really, is is perfection, yeah. and then that's the telos of of everything else. Um, I guess I was just wondering, like, basically, what how we should conceive of of perfection. In, in the case of human beings or in case of anything is it is it analogous to that is it just like well all of the potentials coming out if the touchstone the mahak is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then um in a sense every human being has a subjective understanding of what that ultimate perfection can be because in each creation it projects itself in a particular way um, so that in itself is a very deep discussion. But one way that, for example, the Bayan articulates this echoing Ibn Arabi is that um, the task of every human being, every true believer is to bring things into their perfection. 
and to not do so is um, in a sense a sin, right? So like, you know, slacking off and if you start something and you don't finish it or, you know, you kind of retreat into your own inactivity and whatever, you know, that that is all bad. You shouldn't do that because you are an agent of the all high to bring things into their per perfection. If God has pronounced the, the, the fiat of Kul, B on that thing, you are the Fayakun, and so that your Fayakun is now has that responsibility as the hand of God to bring that thing into its final um, efficient perfection, right? And through this process, then you learn um, that perfection exists both in a universality, but also in the instantiation of a particularity. And that's something that then in itself becomes a um, a kind of thing, a shade through which you understand the nature of perfection itself. And extra extract extrapolating from each instance then about the universal perfection that is God. So so thinking of a human life as a whole, it, it would just be maybe that's something that becomes clear over time as you as you perfect individual things, what what this whole thing is really about. Yes. Um, But action, and this is something implied in Ibn Arabi throughout, action is very, very central part of it. He's also critiquing um, many of those Sufis that would retreat completely from the world. We have nothing more to do with the world. You know, it's like, well, this is a stupid perspective because the being is everywhere. Whether in your retreat out of the world or with whether within your activity and uh, engagement with the world, where are you running to? You can't run away from God. It's everywhere. So who are you appeasing here? Are you appeasing yourself? Or are you appeasing God in this process of retreating out of the world? And this is where then the Sufis of the later generations developed a very involved concept of khalvatar and jaman, you know, um, the retreat within society. You're in there, you're working, you've got a family, you're doing this, that, and the other thing. You're not actually physically retreating the world. It's your inner state in relation to the world that then makes that retreat from the world. Where then you, um, as we read a couple of chapters ago, in your saluk, and especially with the big realizations that come through it, you then then abide in the akhara, the akhara being the resurrection itself. You become that while you're in the, in the dunya, and which is what, what the path of the Gnostic is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think the I think the Christians say something similar, um, something like in the world, but not of the world. Of it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I agree. The retreat from the world it's 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 a natural impulse, especially for anyone who's discovering spirituality, and you know, to want to retreat into solitude to study and contemplate. Those are necessary steps, but as you can't stay there. Obviously, you know the. The hermit gets to the top of the mountain, and at some point, that hermit has to descend the mountain and rejoin yeah. the world. And so, you know, so but at that point, the hermit's back in the world, but not of the oh, world. Um, if you've read any of the writings of Bruce Lee, he has some very interesting perspectives on this in his in his book, The Tao of Jit Kune Do, um, mm. where he says that um, he really began to understand this Tao. Um, in the martial arts at the moment where he was starting to really interact with other people and their styles. And so the style beyond all styles was really formulated for him in his very direct engagement. So he moved beyond the Wing Chun and all of these various other styles while he was synthesizing all kinds of styles that he was learning from here, from there, from over there. That's where the Jute Kwan Do really flowered. And it was in his interaction with all these various other styles. Of martial arts yeah yeah i never read that book but i'm a big fan of bruce lee i i read yeah. another bruce lee book uh just his famous interviews basically and uh the most famous of them all is be water i love that i'm sure yeah. everyone's probably heard that you know yeah. i won't say the whole thing but in the end be water my friend yeah be water but, uh, anyway yeah um ji kundo i'd like to read that Anyway, yeah, thank it's you. Yeah, something that you can find. I'll, I'll find it for PDF for you and I'll send it to you. 
All right. Thanks. No worries. Anyone else? Okay, um, then we'll leave this first part of the chapter. I think you should start on this next zikr and use the zikr that we have currently, which is Yah Ulu, O I, and use it alongside uh, Yah Samadu, O Everlasting. So for this next week, uh, for the zikr, just say Yah Ulu or Yah Samadu together as a combined zikr. Um, and this will be the second part of our chapter of Moses because we're going to also cover the chapter of Khalid, which is very short. Um, and then that leaves us basically with the last chapter of the Fosus al Hikam, which means we have another only three weeks left of this course. Anywho, um, let's leave that here today. And then until we come back together next week, Ya Oluwa. <laughs>